All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for your, for your patience. I know we're a few minutes late. Always some new uh, technical difficulties to deal with. But thank you for everybody that's joining in. Uh, this is Hermela Aragawi. And it's been a long time since I've shared a screen with my friend Nebiu Asfaw, co-founder of the Ethiopian Development Council, Ethiopian American, rather, Development Council. And we really wanted to have this space for people to have the conversation that we're already seeing happen anyway, trying to contextualize it with whatever actual data that we're able to get. Um, and we encourage you guys to comment, ask questions, depending on how it, will, it goes, maybe we'll get somebody in here. But Debbie, so we, you know, we, we talk about this offline all the time, uh, right, in terms of trying to determine what direction are things going in? Uh, what are we able to gather? We don't want to be alarmist, but we also want to be realist. Um, I first want to start, and I think you're, you know, in some ways uh, much more versed on this than I am. But the one thing that stuck out to me uh, was the travel advisory from the U.S. Embassy in Ethiopia today. Uh, they released a uh, high level four travel advisory, which is telling people do not travel to Ethiopia. It is not safe. Um, and this comes after about a, a month of, of not sending out those kind of alarmist um, advisories that we saw throughout the month of December. Um, the Ethiopian government just moved to remove the state of emergency that was put in place in November, uh, much earlier than the, the six months it was projected to be in place. Um, there's a big event happening in Ethiopia uh, that suggests that it is safe for uh, international partners to be there. Um, and so what was your first reaction when you saw this advisory? Yeah, hi, Hermela. First, thank you uh, for having me. It's good to see you. Um, it really uh, was a shock to see the renewal of the uh, travel advisory at this very moment in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, one of the, the the biggest event in Africa is happening, the African Union Summit. This is happening after two years of interruption due to COVID. Um, and it's very curious that this is coming out at a time when um, over a million diaspora members have traveled back home uh, to show as a sim symbolism of resistance to the what um, people consider is the disinformation campaign to make Ethiopia look unstable, right? So um, what we were hoping for with the most recent personnel changes, a new ambassador coming in, a new envoy uh, coming in, that this is signaling a pivot, a change in, in policy. Um, and there has been some changes, but really, um, the travel advisory is just very curious um, and, and really very difficult to even explain on, on why that would happen in the midst of a very important uh, event. Um, just today, 350 plus journalists uh, landed in Ethiopia to cover this um, huge event. The whole city is really excited for this. The whole Africa is, is in Addis right now. So um, there's really absolutely no reason to alarm the public or the world um, about any type of a security threat uh, because there's none. Yeah, it just really sort of takes away some of the faith, I think, that some people had and that there maybe there would be a different approach um, from the US foreign policy side. So two big changes in terms of uh, government officials, right? We've got the... Uh, uh, U.S. ambassador to Ethiopia, who there was a, a notice saying that she's retiring um, and pursuing other opportunities. And uh, a new ambassador, interim ambassador, has been appointed by Secretary Blinken. Um, the only real sign that I've been able to see in terms of what's coming out of potentially her influence is this travel advisory. And so that doesn't look good. Uh, the special envoy, there's no sense that anything different has really happened. The uh, United States tone has changed a little bit. Uh, we did see for the first time the prime minister and uh, 
President Biden actually speaking to each other over the phone. I believe that was sometime in mid-January. The statement that they put out around then the, on the U.S. end uh, no longer was really um, stoking ethnic divisions as it relates to the war in Tigray. Uh, they blanket just talked about how Ethiopians were hurting Obviously, Tigrayans are Ethiopians, uh, but for a long time, there was this distinction that was being made uh, for the people in Tigray that was not being made when the war moved out uh, of that region into the Amhara and Afar regions. And from what we can see, Nebu, there is still some fighting happening through the Afar ends, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's There's a devastating uh, TPLF offense that's occurring. Um, and this is uh, the second time after the Ethiopian Defense Forces and allies stopped um, at the Tigray border that the TPLF recouped and went back on the offense. Um, there's been reports coming out for at least two weeks now of um, the TPLF forces killing civilians, uh, destroying infrastructure. And, and the, the, the only route into Tigray to transport humanitarian relief uh, and, and medical supplies is actually being blocked by the TPLF because of this offensive, right? And, you know, no one knows what they want, um, but, you know, they might be trying to uh, reoccupy Afar. They might be trying to get to the Djibouti uh, highway to, to block um, the Ethiopia from the port. But, you know, they're causing a lot of devastation and uh, we had expected uh, and were hopeful that there would be some proper denunciation from the united states that this is not okay um and and that has been very disappointing however you know with the new ambassador coming in i think she's only been on the post for two days now i'm still hopeful uh, and and urge her and and the new uh, uh leadership that's coming in and to the horn to really look at the TPLF for what they are, the aggressors in this, um, the, 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 the entity that is really terrorizing the region, um, the entity that is blocking Tigray from getting the humanitarian aid. Um, and, and even right now from the uh, four or five months uh, of TPLF occupation of the Amhara region, the, Tig uh, the Afar region, the stories that are coming out, it's just heartbreaking, the rape, uh, the civilian killing, the mass killing, the executions, um, the looting of uh, hospitals and the destruction of hospitals. Um, every single hospital and uh, was destroyed in over 37 towns that were occupied by the TPLF. And, and um, you know, you've seen the, the stories from independent media like um, BT uh, that, 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 and, and uh, you know, Jeff Pierce and others that are showing us eyewitness accounts of all this devastation that TPLF has caused and uh, is causing, and still there has not been a proper condemnation from the United States. And, and I think that it is never too late um, to uh, pivot. Uh, it is never too late to do the right thing. And, and it's time uh, for the United States, for the new leadership to really pause and say, where are we going? You're talking about Ethiopia. You're talking about the Horn of Africa combined with a population of uh, close to 150 million, that's almost as big as the entire Western Europe, right? Um, Ethiopia is the 12th largest country in the world, uh, population-wise. So this is not nothing. And, and, and to risk it all for less than 100 people. Now, I would argue that all this destruction is being caused by less than 100 people, the leaders of the TPLF that uh, really uh, uh, chose violence to settle their differences, that declared the war on November 3rd, um, that, that called the ceasefire in June a sick joke. And even right now, uh, when there was a door opening for peace, that they're going back on the offense because they are trying to save their own seat uh, of power. And, and this must be very clear for the international community, for the United States, and that um, this is all the Horn of Africa wants, the people of Ethiopia, the people of Africa. And quite frankly, the American people want peace. 
The American people want their government to be part of peace, not 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 supporting um, an organization, an entity, a criminal entity that is being led by um, this uh, people that have no disregard regard for human life. And unfortunately, they're dragging the United States down the dirt with them. Um, and it is just really mind boggling for me how this administration just does not see that. Yeah, it's certainly mind boggling. It, there's really no logic to it. I mean, at this point, regardless of where they thought things were going to go, um, CPLF is a bad bet. It's a bad bet for the country. It's a bad bet for Tigray. I was surprised, but not surprised to see that even Tigray TV was recently admitting about 300,000 people have died in this war. Of course, they're not specifically attributing it to this war. They left it sort of open-ended uh, and were focusing a lot of their uh, energy at the prime minister. But what that tells me is even by their own admission, 300,000 people have potentially died in Tigray. That is insane. That is just, when we think about that number, and I've heard estimates that are even greater than that, it, it doesn't make sense that this entity that is willing to drag their people literally into the ground uh, can be taken seriously, which brings us to some of the uh, and some of this is speculation in terms of, uh, I believe they didn't call it negotiations, but talks. Uh, Deborah Zion was on BBC recently and said that uh, he is speaking with the government, whether through a mediator uh, or directly. There's a sense that uh, the Ethiopian government is talking to somebody that is, or some entity that is considered a representative in Tigray. And I think the fear for some people is that TPLF will get a seat at the table. I personally do not think that's going to happen. I just don't think the entire Horn of Africa would have it. There's too much damage done that it sets a horrific precedent. I think it's very different than some of the releases that we saw um, in early January when you're talking about somebody that's not in that region, that's uh, aging and, and sick, as complicated as that release was. Um, for those that are in Tigray to, that are leading this war to be able to then get a seat at the table for it with any for any sort of power, I just don't think it's possible. What 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 are you gathering from what you've uh, heard and read? There is absolutely um, no future for the TPLF and the Horn of Africa. Absolutely none. And the future of the new Ethiopia um, will not have a place for that. The people of Ethiopia will not have it any other way. Um, look, 27 years of torture, 27 years of gross human rights violation. This was an entity that had one of the worst human rights record in the world. Um, the reason why so many of us are uh, in the diaspora is, is we left Ethiopia because of the TPLF. And when is enough enough? Isn't three decades of power enough? And, and this totalitarian regime has been removed from power. The people have said enough. They want to move on. Um, the TPLF has been um, a source of uh, pain, not just for Ethiopia, but for Eritrea, for Somalia, for the whole region, right? And a new dawn is upon the Horn of Africa right now. And whether the United States or the Western government, whoever is pushing the TPLF, they're not going to win. The TPLF is done, right? Um, so the notion that there's going to be some kind of a negotiation, and even if there is a negotiation, um, it is not going to uh, mean that the TPLF will come back as a legit entity. I say that confidently because the people, 140 million people, are, are, are have said enough. I've said no more to this entity, and and you've seen the backlash that has come i mean to be frank the massive backlash that that we witnessed uh when subhat naga was released uh, from prison right um that is just a sign where of where the people are that was a backlash throughout the horn not just in ethiopia um so you know there's a lot of propaganda there's a lot of uh, disinformation that's coming out uh, especially from the tplf where they're trying to make themselves more uh 
uh, visible or more important than they are. But at this point, TPLF is in a position where they can no longer fight their way out. Um, there has been a military solution. They have been defeated militarily. They have been defeated in public opinion. Um, the world has seen their true color and and the, the devastation they left behind in Amhara and Afar is just being seen by the world. So the world knows who the aggressor is. The world now knows who's seeking peace, right? Um, the truth has come out. Um, so there is absolutely no way uh, if there is any kind of negotiation, uh, it would be a it should be a negotiation for the leaders of the TPLF to disarm and to surrender. Yeah, and, and we actually don't know what the people in Tigray think either, right? They've been under this uh, war for 15 plus months. Uh, there are parents who have not seen their kids. Uh, there are areas that are not getting the aid that they need, especially as this war continues on. Uh, and that there is, it, at this point, there is a humanitarian crisis in Tigray. I spoke with an official that says, they're also concerned about the people there because this is really making it difficult for aid to get to certain places uh, that it needs to. And it's people that were already on safety nets before. And now during this war, there, there are people that are dying, not just as a direct result of the war. So it's, you know, I, I no longer really try to speak to the diaspora who claim to be advocates in that region. But, you know, I just wonder if that's what's going to take, because I think the U.S. sort of not saying anything is somewhat co-signing uh, what's happening in the north. Um, and then the diaspora as a whole, uh, at least in terms of those that that feel like they have connections to Tigray, are also just kind of living on this hope that the U.S. or somebody's going to come in uh, and save them. And then another shift I saw, which just isn't going in a positive direction in terms of the foreign policy um, in that region is a recent tweet I saw uh, from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I'm gonna read it to you guys. There's a part of it that's not problematic. I think there's another part of it that signals something really dangerous. So it's uh, from the Senate Foreign Account, Ethio HRC Human Rights Commission findings link state security forces in the death of 14 elders in Oromia in December. The Oromo are among the communities that suffered from state-sponsored violence before and during the war. As the U.S. supports peace in Ethiopia, we must also pursue justice for atrocities. Okay, obviously part of that, nothing wrong with highlighting atrocities, but as we know, the U.S. doesn't do that for no reason, at least in terms of U.S. foreign policy. So now there seems to be a shift in terms of trying to appeal to uh, Oromos. And I think anything that only appeals to one ethnicity or the other in that region signals to me the same tactic. They did it with Tigray, it didn't work. It actually really hurt the people. So now they're gonna see if they can latch on to the tribalist element in the Oromo community and possibly OLA, uh, which is where I get concerned about the aid that was going there. There's nothing wrong with the aid that US aid um, just uh, uh, just offered out, but you wonder what are they going to do? They're, I mean, they're, we know that aid is used to fuel war. So I think that is something that's concerning and that needs uh, to be watched. Um, and then we also have to remember AGOA is still a thing. And it was because of human rights abuses that we were uh, removed from AGOA, but there's no mention of human rights abuses by their old partners. Yeah, um, Hermela, I mean, that, that tweet um, uh, from the Senate Foreign Affairs, I know that tweet uh, comes from the uh, Idaho, the office of the Idaho Senator, uh, James Rich. Uh, and, you know, it's been very bothersome, some of the uh, rhetorics coming out of that office. Um, and, you know, it's absolutely terrible that the 14 people died in Oromia. It's heartbreaking. It's always heartbreaking when we hear of death. Um, you know, but what is really bothersome with the tweet is the selective outrage, mm -hmm. right? Um, just just a few days ago, um, there was reports of hundreds of Afar, uh, Afarians, uh, Afar people dying. Um, and then reports are still coming out of the thousands of Amharas that have been slaughtered, uh, rape victims, children that were raped, not a single word coming out of the Senate 
foreign uh, uh, office, not a single word of condemnation to the TPLF. And, and the region that they're commenting about in Oromia is where um, the, the other terrorist organization, affiliate, uh, OLA, operates. Um, this organization has been massacring civilians, massacring ethnic minorities in the region, killing Amhara people, other ethnic people, not a single word. Uh, but what's curious now is the 14 people uh, that were killed, uh, the report said were killed by government uh, forces. Um, so they're condemning when, when something happens by the government, but when the OLA is literally burning down villages, burning down churches, killing civilians, entire villages have been killed, hundreds of people in a day, in Olega and other areas, not a word. Um, and this is consistent with what they were doing in Tigray. This is consistent with what they're doing in Afar and in and, and, and Amhara. Anytime that the, the OLA or the TPLF are committing crimes, it is look the other way. Anytime that they, the government is doing something or, or uh, the Amhara forces, the Afar forces, FANO, they defend themselves. It's like all hell breaks loose. It's, it's, you know, human rights violations, this and that. So, you know, we condemn human rights violations on all sides everywhere, but people have the right to defend. But this is a really clear indication of where the policy stands and what kind of behavior they're, they're trying to influence. Another um, interesting thing, and we know this for a fact, is uh, we've seen it uh, during colonial era when the colonialists come to Africa what they do is they pick one tribe and they play them against the other, right? And they've tried that in Ethiopia to play uh, our brothers and sisters in Tigray against Amhara, Amhara against Oromo, Oromo against Somali, Somali against Afar, right? This is typical divide and conquer rule. So, I mean, there was a, a large donation that was made, for example, uh, last week, 10 billion bur, uh, specifically to the Oromia region, right? And that's amazing. That's wonderful. That should be encouraged. But um, at the same time, uh, AGOA was passed, Ethiopia being sanctioned out of millions of dollars. Uh, Tigra is devastated. Afar is devastated. Amhara is devastated. But, you know, it's just really curious what they do to, to, to cause this friction within the Ethiopian people. So what I would like to say is that we have to keep our eyes open. We have to be conscious of things that are done even when something seems like a kind gesture or um, like a, a charity, um, we have to look behind that, what is the intention? And, and absolutely at this point, um, we all as Ethiopians, as a Horn of Africa, as Africans have to be very, very cautious not to be divided alongside tribe, tribe or religion. Circuit, secretarianism is what is going to uh, cause us further damage. So um, what I would like to say is, I, I think some people are commenting in the comment section about this, but we absolutely need to make sure, you know, more than ever to stay united, even if we have political differences, even if ideal ideologies are different, this is the time to stick together and to say, you know, no to the divisions. Yeah, it's, you know, it's just so age old, you know, it, it doesn't work. This war is an example of that. Um, and I thought it was really interesting who liked and reshared that tweet from the Senate for Foreign Relations. It was a few uh, advocates on Twitter or that stood out to me anyway, uh, that are of Oromo descent, that are very much tribalist in nature, that have been supporting TPLF throughout this uh 15 month war. And it's like, wow, it, we're not going to learn like that is not going to save your people. It's not going to save yourself. It's I mean, we have a literally live example of that. Right. So I think most of us get it. Most of us get this ethnicity division doesn't make sense. Not everybody fits in a box as it is. So you can't even apply it. Um, uh, like you're supposed to. And I think that sort of brings us into uh, the the ethnic federalism conversation, which I think that people uh, have been really wanting to have. They feel like it's overdue. Um, and there's no real indication that the government is moving uh, away from that. Uh, 
But that's really something that probably has to be reconsidered for some of this violence to go away. I want to read some uh, uh, a question from the comment section. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We got 400 people live. That's pretty good. Um, and I always forget to say this, but please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Appreciate yes, it. Yes, like and share. And share. <laughs> I always have friends being and like, why, why don't you say that? So uh, please subscribe. It would mean a lot. Really appreciate all the interest and support. Okay. Uh, user Proud Habesha says, what makes me wonder is what is in it for the Biden administration? Does Do they really care about democracy in Ethiopia or do they have another agenda? Do you want to try a crack at that? <laughs> yeah, I will. I will say this. Um, the foreign policy of the Biden administration right now I have more questions than answers because globally, I'm sorry to say, but it is a mess. It's a train wreck uh, from Afghanistan to uh, what's happening in, in the, the Ukraine. Um, and and Ethiopia is no different. What is happening makes absolutely no sense. Um, you know, a stable Ethiopia, a democratic Ethiopia is in the best interest of the United States. An economically vibrant Ethiopia that is trading with the United States is in the best interest of the United States. Um, a united Horn of Africa, a peaceful Eritrea, a peaceful Somalia that work together is in the best interest of the United States and the American people. Um, but why is this administration or some in the policy are so gung-ho in, in reviving the TPLF and bringing back the TPLF? And look, you know, I, I believe there's a consensus that uh, this administration favors the TPLF. I think the only people that think that the United States right now is not supporting the TPLF is people in that Biden administration. Um, there's been sanctions against Ethiopia. There's been sanctions against Eritrea. There has been measures after measure to basically tie the hands of the Ethiopian people. There's been uh, rhetorics against the Amhara um, forces, the Afar forces, everyone but the TPLF. Um, and it's not even an opinion, it's factual. You can see it out there that the TPLF is being favored. And 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 to make it worse, it's not even for the Tigrayan people. It is for a very small, elite, very affluent people that have had a good life for decades, that have had privileges that no one has had, it is about bringing these people back. Um, is it friendship? Is it loyalty? Or is it something that they think that they would offer the United States that the you know the rest of Ethiopia cannot offer? I, I don't know. But you know, we're making a call as people, as Americans. Um, we are speaking up because um, the the direction that this is going is not in the best interest of the United States, and that's why we're saying no more. That's why we're saying that a pivot is needed at this very moment, and it is not too late. And I think it is a good time uh, for the Biden administration and the new le leadership that's coming in to correct this wrong. We don't have to go back to the past and litigate what happened, who did what, you know, forget about it, right? Let's make it right. Let's correct the wrongs. Uh, let's tell, tell the TPL of enough. They've had enough. It's 96 people that need um, to be arrested or I mean exiled, I don't care. They just need to get out of there so that uh, we can move on, so that we could uh, finally give the Tigran people the opportunity to elect their own leaders, right? To choose their own destiny. You cannot tell me TPLF speaks for the Tigran people. Um, I, I, I wanna share a story just a, a week ago, we had some of our people on the ground in Afar and they had a, a chance to speak with some captured prisoners of war. TPLF prisoners of war. Some of them were 14 year old, 13 year old. Um, and we have videos and, and testimonies from this TPLF uh, soldiers, child soldiers. They were telling us they were forced and that every Tigran family, even to get aid, that you have to give a son or a daughter to this war. Imagine that you don't have enough food to eat, you're struggling, you don't know what's going on. And then this TPLF that comes in and and tells you they're fighting for you, forces you to give up your 14 year old child so they can go die in a war. It's enough, like it's really enough. And, and, and there's really no way to sugarcoat this. 
The State Department must stop this. It is time to tell the TPLF enough. Enough is enough, and the time is now. Not another death, not another soul, not another life. And, and if the U.S. does wield its influence and, and stop giving the TPLF hope and unequivocally call for their surrender, they have no other choice but to surrender. And that's how peace will come. And peace can come within days if, if the State Department, if this administration chose to make it happen. Yeah, that would be, you know, in a in a in a different world, uh, that is how the United States would wield its power. Uh, but they won't even say the letters TPLF. They will not point the blame in that direction. To your point, no one has been more hurt by this conflict than the people in Tigray. I've seen estimates from legitimate sources from 500,000 to 1.2 million. I can't even grasp that kind of death toll. And that region has seen war three times in the last few decades. So there are families that are each each decade essentially uh, giving up people. I remember seeing uh, an interview with this mother on um, Tigray TV where she said she sent five of her kids. I don't know how many kids she had total, but that's a lot of kids to send to this war. Did they come back? We don't know. So these are stories that we'll only hear once there is peace. Um, and you know, from some of the other things happening around the world, uh, we were talking earlier about uh, the State Department spokesperson, Ned Price, who was doing an interview about the U.S. sending 3,000 troops to Eastern Europe as part of this is conflict with Russia that, that's pretty vague in terms of uh, what it's really about. But the U.S. is alleging that uh, Russian troops are moving in towards Ukraine. And so now they've sent 3,000 troops. And there was a press conference earlier where this AP reporter, I believe he was with the AP, was really pressing the spokesperson to say, why are we doing this? And he read some vague statement and they were going back and forth. And basically uh, the spokesperson said, well, it's because we have intelligence that we're confident in. And then the journalist said, just like you are confident with WMDs in Iraq. So this is a U.S. problem, right? At this point, it's we cannot be making enemies everywhere. The economy is taking a hit. Inflation uh, is out of control. U.S. goods are an all-time high in three decades. So for the sake of the country, we have to find, find different ways to relate to other countries because the power dynamics are shifting. There's this great Indian uh, poet who uh, wrote this poem, basically, uh, uh, poem rather, basically saying, fortunately, power has a shelf life, right? It, there was a shelf life for TPLF. There was a moment where they could have shifted without too much damage. There's also a shelf life for something as great as the U.S. or any Western power. Dynamics can change. And I don't know what it's going to take. You know, I don't know who. There's so many smart people that work in U.S. government, that are here, that are that, that care. But for some reason, when it comes to the final decisions, it seems like some erratic, illogical person uh, is making them. So sorry, I, I talked too much, but I, I want to um, read a comment. Do you want something or do you want to add something to that, Nabi? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, ma'am, I just was looking at a comment from uh, Mel Tawahid. Uh, I mean, we are grateful for the United States has been a great uh, friend to the Ethiopian, especially the American people are kind people, very kind people, um, very generous and, and have had a hundred plus years relationship with the Ethiopian people. Um, the issue we're having is with the policy of the administration, the foreign policy, uh, which uh, and, and what we're advocating is in the best interest of the United States. Um, but I wanted to also address, um, you know, uh, connected with the previous question someone had asked, um, do you see a united Ethiopia? Ethiopia is united. Um, and a majority of Ethiopia is united. If you remember, one of the threats uh, Hermela, that, that TPLF was making is, if we don't rule Ethiopia, Ethiopia will fall apart, mm -hmm. right? It didn't happen. Ethiopia is more united than ever before. The diaspora is united ever, more than ever before. But how do we get to the next step? And you know what uh, you mentioned earlier about ethnic federalism, and this tribal politics, does that need to end? Absolutely, like yesterday, right? We don't need that. Um, the, the, that's a hallmark of the TPLF. That was the method that was used
to divide Ethiopia, but it didn't work. It has failed. It has failed. So it's time to, to turn the chapter. Uh, I mean, heck, it's time to open a new book and write our own history, right? And that starts with, um, in my opinion, abolishing uh, this uh, ethnicized, uh, weaponizing our ethnicity through ethnic politics. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as far as like what we can actually do in this moment, and I know you've already touched on this just now, it's just staying unified. That doesn't mean you have to agree with everybody else, but just kind of keeping your eye on the prize or your eye on the ball in terms of what's the biggest danger? It's war. Who feels it? We know there's some external actors and some internal actors. So keeping our eye on that. And then there's a lot of internal issues as well. And just being able to talk about those in a way that doesn't throw away the entire unity. It's a this is a little bit of a controversial question, but I, I want to throw it out there because I think that uh, it opens up an important conversation. All right, uh, a little risky, but I'm gonna do it. So this is again from Prad Habesha, and then I'll and then I'll get to a question uh, from Ahmed Musa. I have he says he or she, I have not been to Ethiopia over two decades. I'm hearing from family and friends that oromization of Addis is in full swing. Are we fighting the war to replace Tigrayans by Oromos? Just saying. Do you want to respond to that? Or I can, and then you can. Um, look, um, a, a majority, like 99% of um, uh, people in Addis Ababa and Oromia and, and, and Somali and Afar and every region of Ethiopia want equality. And I, I, will, I will repeat something the president of the Somali region said that uh, any region or any people that want justice must want justice for all, not um, having privileges over other people. And, and I think that this is completely understood by the Ethiopian people. The Ethiopian people are sick and tired of the tribalism and putting one over the other, right? Now, with that said, are there people who, who believe and feel like it's my turn, I am this and this tribe and that um, it's, you know, it's time for me uh, to have supremacy, this and that. Absolutely, yes. But, but those are the elements of the, 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 the weaponization of tribalism that we all must stand together and say, no, enough. We've had enough. That no one should be judged based on their ethnicity or who you're, I didn't choose who I was to, you know, to be born. I didn't choose my color. I didn't choose my nationality. I didn't choose my gender. I was born like this. this creator gave me this. Judge me based on my character. Judge me based on what I did. Um, just because I'm born from a certain ethnicity, I don't deserve any privilege or I don't need to be uh, crucified or discriminated against. And, and that is the spirit of the new Ethiopia. And that is the spirit of the new Addis Ababa. And, and, and it, that's why it is very important that, that um, any force or any um, belief, any kind of uh, ideology that thinks it's um, you know, a certain tribe over another must be marginalized as soon as possible. Um, and and you know, and uh, what they say in Amharic, Buzuhan, the Buzuhan, his desire is equality and ju and justice for all. Yeah, absolutely. I love the way you put that. That's the spirit of the new Ethiopia. I would argue that's the spirit of the new Africa. I would even go further to say that's just the spirit of this new global world. People know better, right? We know better than to decide how we feel about people or their character by their ethnicity or race or gender or even nationality. The, the world has gotten so much bigger to really uh, narrow it down to tribe or race just doesn't make any sense. I want to welcome anyone that's just coming in. We've got almost 600 people on this live. And thank you to everyone who's also very engaged in the comment section. Uh, we've got a moderator that's going through them. And then also thank you for folks who donated through Super Chat. It's the first time I'm using this. So I really appreciate your generosity uh, to be able to make chats like this happen. Okay. Uh, let me respond to that comment that I decided to read and then made you respond to. I don't know everything that's happening in Addis. I have heard someone speak that same way about the oromization of Addis. What I would say, and again, 
People may have personal experiences. They may feel like they're being discriminated against because they're not Oromo. So I'm not denying that. But I think even the language of saying the Oromization of Addis, what does that even mean? So you're seeing more Oromos in positions that maybe you didn't see before. They're a large majority. I mean, it's we have to be really careful turning everything into a tribalist issue because it probably isn't, at least when you break it down, right? It's not an institutionalized racism as far as uh, we've seen. So let's just, I appreciate the question. I appreciate the candidness, but in general, I think when we start talking like that, it builds up resentment from one group. Um, and then we start to look at each other, you know, fearfully from a different tribalist lens. So thank you for sharing. Um, and then go ahead. Nabi. Can I add something to that, Hermi? And, and there was another person uh, making comments that if it's not this way, it's going to go back to like unitary this and that. Um, I live in Denver, Colorado. Hermi lives in Los Angeles. How many nationalities are in your, in your city? I mean, Countless. LA. Yeah, LA, everyone from everywhere in, in the world is in LA. That's an international city. Denver is becoming mm -hmm. that. Um, you know, <laughs> there is 50,000 Ethiopians that live right here in, in Aurora, Colorado. There's people from all over the world, right? We all speak our languages. We have our own media for God's sake right now. And we're talking, we have freedom, we're working, we're opening businesses. There's not an issue, right? We're living in harmony right here in the United States. Why would it be so difficult to live in peace in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, throughout Ethiopia? There's no reason why one has to uh, be supreme over the other. We all can speak our languages. We all can, you know, live wherever we want. Um, and, and that's where we need to go. And that's why we need to get rid of this ethnicized politics. Um, I want to be able to go to Ethiopia, to any region, and and work and live you know right now unfortunately a chinese person has more rights than me in some regions of ethiopia because i'm going to be asked what's your tribe what's your this what's your that you know that's what needs to stop and especially those of you who live in the diaspora like in america and canada and the west you know you see how many people from all over the world are here in your town in your neighborhood living in peace no issue you can practice whatever religion you want. So we can have that in Ethiopia. And, and that's what we need to aspire to. No one has to be supreme over the other. And then we all can learn m multiple languages. Language is not an issue. It's all about respect. And it's all about trusting each other. Yeah, and just going yeah. back to if it doesn't work in the US, then it probably doesn't work in an African country, just not using double standards. I mean, it's insane to think about LA or California broken up into ethnic or, or racial uh, districts. Like it would, n people would not even think of it, right? So then why do we then recommend it to a foreign country? It doesn't work. We've actually given it about 30 years to see if it does work, and it doesn't. So it, there, there's just the, the double standard that sometimes even folks within uh, also use. But if you just apply it to your life, it doesn't really work. I want to, for anyone that's some of the new people that are coming in in the last uh, short while, I want to sort of summarize what this conversation was about. We were discussing whether there's a real um, change in U.S. foreign policy towards the Horn of Africa. We have seen uh, the uh, U.S. ambassador to Ethiopia switched out. We saw the special envoy to the Horn also switched out uh, earlier in the year at the end of last year. Um, but today there was a U.S. embassy travel advisory, highest level do not travel, that looked a lot like the advisories we saw throughout December. It was very fear mongering. Uh, and as Nebu, you mentioned, coming at a time where the AU uh, summit is happening in Addi. So it can't be that both things are true. So it's possible this is an indication that things are going back to the same tone. Uh, it remains to be seen. We're all trying to be hopeful. I mean, we, we love this country for everything that it gives us. Uh, it's just, we, we, you know, we live in a global world. So if we have peace, why can't somebody else has pe have peace? Why can't a hundred plus million people have peace? There's no reason why we can't hold both uh, thoughts in in the same uh, space. Uh, 
keep uh, throwing some comments and questions in, uh, even with the moderator having a hard time keeping up, uh, but we're happy to answer some questions. Uh, Nevi, do you think there is a slight chance that the U.S. will utter the word CPLF in the same uh, message in that they need to disarm? What are the chances? I don't think that they have a choice but to do that. Um, and if if not, um, this administration is not going to be here forever. The Biden administration is already losing the black vote um, unless they're willing to stand up with the people and say enough and utter the word TPLF, you're done. Um, I, I I don't you know I, I don't think that uh, uh, they're 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 gonna. Um, I don't think they're going to be able to get back the gratitude of um, Africans and the black community. Um, there's just so much wrong going on and that I, I don't know that they can uh, continue to stick by the TPLF and risk it all. They're risking it all already. Yeah. I'm, I mean, hopeful, they will. I'm hopeful. I mean, yeah. It, at the end of the day, this war will end somehow, some way. Um, I don't think the TPLF are going to be a part of the new future, but a lot of the opposition have been engaged in conversations. The opposition that didn't weren't given the space in Tigray when they had that election or for years before. Um, and so really, at the end of the day, I do think this is going to go in the direction of peace. Eventually, it's a matter of is the U.S. going to use this opportunity to do something to be able to say, yeah, we had a part in that. And it seems like the window is closing in. And particularly if we start seeing things happening in the South that uh, that that may suggest that there's interference there or uh, uh, fueling violence there, then it's I mean, it's kind of it. Right. Like, where do you go from there? Uh, but I really hope that that's not the case because we all live in or a lot of us live in both worlds and we want to be able to live in both of them peacefully. Uh, sorry, I took forever to get to this question. Ahmed, uh, he says, Ahmed Musa, why do you think the NGO were sent home in Eritrea? It's because we have everything, but they want to divide us religiously. It's a complicated issue, right? The NGOs. I mean, I, I don't even know why we took that aid in the Ormia region. I mean, in the large scheme of things, it wasn't that much money, but it's, it does make me nervous in terms of whether that gives them a, um, a foothold in that region to be able to uh, stoke any tensions. What do you think about the issue of um, aid? Yeah, well, the issue of aid is very concerning when it comes from the US aid, uh, which is run by Samantha Powers, who has a clear political agenda in Ethiopia, unfortunately. Um, and in her hearing, when she was getting confirmation in Congress, um, she did say that 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 she is planning to use the U.S. aid um, as a, as a means to get a political, um, um, you know, uh, for a political reason, right? And and that is not uh, what true humanitarianism is about. Humanitarianism is about helping people, right? So um, you know, there's countries like Eritrea that kicked out the U.S. aid and have still managed to meet uh, the Millennium Development Goals, right? Um, you know, Ethiopia needs a lot of help. Um, there's a lot of NGOs that are very helpful to the Ethiopian people. And the Ethiopian people are grateful for the kind American people that have spent hundreds of millions uh, helping. Um, however, there's just certain aspect um, of the aid community, particularly with those um, with a political agenda to use aid as a Trojan horse um, to, to um, uh, you know, uh, put political pressure on nations. And, and that's not fair and that's not ethical. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going through a few comments. We're going to try to run through some a little bit faster. Uh, there's one that I think speaks to, we we'll almost, would almost be remiss if we didn't have this conversation. So I'm going to bring in Mesfin Wenda, too long. I'll try it next time. But Mesfin, uh, your comment says, we were going towards reversing U.S. policy before Abi flashed cold water to the entire diaspora movement. We don't have a partner at home. He already bowed to the USA. Nebu, I'm going to give that to you first. Look, um, um, our movement, the No More movement, was not about an individual. It was not about the prime minister. It was not about the government. It was about the Ethiopian people. 
not only the Ethiopian people, it is about the Horn of Africa, the Eritrean people, the African people. And it is still, that's still what it is. It is a movement for justice. It is a movement to protect the marginalized people from undue pressure and undue discrimination from Western powers. And it is still intact. We are still here. We're still making the movement. Uh, no one can kill the movement. Um, and and I disagree with, with what was said. There's a lot of things that are being said, um, but um, no more movement. No one can stop it anymore. Um, I mean, just a few days ago in Mali, uh, they're saying no more to, to France. And Burkina Faso, we've seen it, people saying no more. Uh, it's not even an Ethiopian thing anymore. It's a Pan-African thing. It's a global resistance uh, to say enough. Um, and it is here to stay. It is here to stay. And, and one thing I want to clarify is that no more movement, the resistance movement is not about a hashtag or Twitter trend. You're not going to have a twi Twitter trending forever. It just doesn't work like that. What it is is what is being done on the ground, what is being done on the streets, what is being done in conversations and in movements. And, and that is happening and that is going in the right direction. And, and I would say that we are united, still united, um, and not just the Ethiopian people, we're united as Africans. So, you know, don't listen to the naysayers that want to create the, this illusion that there is this big division. There is not. Um, and, and no one can stop the no more movement. No government can stop it or no individual can stop it. So um, I just want to encourage you all to continue to speak up um, for justice, to continue to speak up for the people of Ethiopia, for the people of the Horn. And that is all we can do. We push through and the people always win. Absolutely. It's it's way bigger than any of us. I mean, it's 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 almost like a obviously it had a lot to do with people's awakening and seeing a lot of things and being able to connect the dots through social media and having been through decades and some cases longer of subjugation uh, and finally certain things coming together. And then there's, I just think there's a divine element to it. It's not going to uh, just go away because somebody said the wrong thing or the timing of something is wrong. I do think that people need to continue to be engaged, but it's, I mean, the cat's out of the bag. It, there are countries like Mali who are one of the poorest countries in the world. And even after official French colonization, there's so many different ways that they're being colonized. Uh, the reason that from what I gather from uh, interviewing some folks there in Mali, they said they kicked out the French troops because the French troops came in after uh, the, the, the assassination of Gaddafi because there was so much violence that was coming in from Libya. So there was two groups that were fighting and, and some of those groups were bleeding into Mali. Uh, so there was a huge violence problem. So they thought that the French troops would actually help them. Uh, and in fact, nearly a decade later, they realized the problem was getting worse and their suspicion that they might be, the French are playing both sides and, and helping and arming some of the uh, insurgent groups as well. So it's, it's, it's a culmination of decades and more of subjugation. And so I think that uh, it always behooves us to think beyond the Ethiopia lens. Um, but to answer specifically to to what you're saying, Mastin, because it, it keeps coming up, um, the timing of those releases was not ideal. Um, you know, it was a couple of days before the rally. I don't think a rally is what makes the movement, although we saw an amazing show during the global rally. We have to know and believe that this movement is so much deeper than that. Um, it's so much uh, deeper in terms of trying to right some in in inequities. And at the end of the day, we'll see. We'll see what the Ethiopian government is doing. We'll see what concessions they make. Uh, and we'll have time to react to that. But they're, they're aware that everybody is watching um, and they do not want to make concessions that will jeopardize the peace of the people. We're going longer than I thought we would on this, but we'll try to get a couple more uh, comments in this. If there's any burning questions, uh, go ahead and write them in the comment section. Uh, in the meantime, maybe if you could just kind of summarize for some folks that are coming in here, the premise of this conversation. Yeah, well, welcome everyone for coming. Um, uh, make sure you, you like uh, Hermela's channel and make sure you share it. Um, we are um, 
discussing the recent uh, personnel changes, uh, the shakeup at the State Department and the Horn of Africa, a new uh, Horn of Africa envoy coming in, um, a new interim ambassador coming in. What does that mean? Have we seen enough changes towards the policy to the Horn? Um, you know, we talked about how um, the, the tone of the United States has changed. Um, the president uh, reaching out and contacting Prime Minister Abe. Uh, it's, a, it's a sign in the right direction as far as um, in context where the U.S. used to call Kenya uh, to make uh, policy decisions. But uh, when we look at what has really changed, um, we um, are saying that, you know, we haven't seen a major shift in policy. Um, we still have not seen any condemnation, a meaningful condemnation of the TPLF. There is one thing and only one thing that we want is the TPLF to surrender and disarm. And, and that the United States has not acted upon. Um, the, the massacre that has been committed in Amhara and Afar has not been completely acknowledged by the United States. And, and as we speak right now, the TPLF is back in the offense, re-invading the Afar region, uh, blocking humanitarian aid and medical supplies, and Ethiopia is getting blamed for it. There's still not a condemnation. So uh, we are hopeful that the, the changes in personnel, um, the new ambassador coming in, who's only been there for a day or two, um, that we're hopeful, hopeful that this is the time that the United States finally decides to stand with the people, to stand with democracy, and, and say enough to this tyrant, uh, TPLF, that, that um, have shown their true color over the past four or five, four, five months, and that there is no longer a way to justify what the TPLF has, has been doing. And with that, um, we've also talked about Ethiopia staying united. Uh, we argue that the Ethiopian people are united more than ever. Um, and elements that are trying to divide us uh, through tribal lines, uh, whether it comes through a form of uh, uh, aid or whether it is um, pressures that are occurring because of ethnic federalism, um, we agree that we all need to stand together and that the future Ethiopia um, is one where we're judged by our character, not by our uh, ethnicity. And, and we agreed that the future Ethiopia is one that does not politicize um, our, our ethnicities. Uh, so that means the end of ethnic federalism, which I believe has been the, the force of evil to most of our problems in, in Ethiopia. Yeah, oof, too much, too much. Um, Yamlak just said, what should we expect with the new ambassador? Is there a policy change? I don't know if you just came in or if you want something really pointed, but basically we're hopeful, not seeing any indications that the approach, approach has changed. There was a travel advisory today that was, was very uh, uh, reminiscent of what we were seeing during December, it seemed to come out of nowhere. Uh, what I learned about those travel advisories is they really affect people's lives on the ground. So if they're uh, international um, workers or people that have their kids in international schools, they keep hearing this. Some of them tend to leave because they're concerned about the safety. And that, that means they're uprooting their life. They may have been there for decades, years. And then recently uh, when I was there, some were coming back because they realized it was safe. And so to see these Travel advisories, again, is so disappointing because they really do disrupt people's lives. Um, and I don't think that the terror element is is as much there now in Ethiopia because people kind of have seen this for a while and have become a little more, more immune to it. But nonetheless, it's still scary to see those kind of uh, advisories. Uh, so, uh, Sulahi, thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, question is, what is the next step of the movement? No more planning to have structure, shape, form, and accountability. I'll start because I keep putting you on the spot. <laughs> Guess whoever reads the question answers the question. Uh, yes, it is It is uh, a registered nonprofit, but the movement is likely to operate outside of that. Uh, we have been working on some documentation to make it clear uh, what the uh, values of the movement are. We do have a website, which I feel like we have not done a good job promoting, uh, or maybe I haven't, nomore.global. And there you can find a mission statement, which is uh, something we didn't have a month ago because 
we were all just kind of trying to keep up with the, the demands of the moment. Uh, we hope to have, uh, and feel free to correct me or jump in, uh, Nebia, at any point. We hope to have something like a, a declaration, like a value, uh, the things that we believe in, right? And the, re the reason for that is, one, it crystallizes uh, what we're talking about, you know, are we anti-West? Of course not. But to actually have that in writing and explain it to people helps. Uh, you know, are we a pro-Ethiopian government? No, we're not. We're supportive of the government insofar as, you know, it is fighting an external power that is fueling a war there. But that does not mean uh, we're aligned with the government. We're independent. Um, and then beyond war, what things do we uh, do? We stand for economic cooperation, economic development, uh, equities in every sector, education, health, et cetera, et cetera. So we're writing that stuff out. Um, and I think that will um, help sort of inform people because the other thing we'll want to do eventually is co-sign campaigns that are already happening if they meet those requirements. But in order to know that they meet the requirements, we need to really be clear about what the requirements are. Um, I hope that answered some of it. Accountability. I don't, I don't, I mean, please elaborate what you mean by that. Like I know in general what that word means, but uh, please feel free to clarify because I think that is important and we're happy to try to answer. Uh, Nevi, what's your, what's, what's your answer for this? Accountability. Uh, not, um, not so much that part, but I'll, I'll read you the whole question. What is the next step of the movement? No more is no more planning to have structure, shape, form, and accountability. Yeah, um, what I would encourage people um, when they think of no more is you are no more, right? What are you doing um, for the movement, right? Um, it takes everyone, and, and that is what has made this global resistance movement strong. It's about uh, talking to your neighbors. It's, it's about um, making sure that um, you, you stay united and 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 that's really it. Um, and 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 no more movement is still um, a force to reckon with, um, honestly. And 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 that is why it's uh, spreading across Africa. That is why it's spreading across the the, the Caribbean and, and Haiti and, and Jamaica. Uh, it's about being together um, and and not giving time and space for for disinformation, where um, this kind of disinformation where they try to make you question yourself or question your movement and discourage you. That is not the truth. That is not the truth. The truth is that you are no more, all of us are part of the movement, the resistance, and in every uh, uh, way that we can, whether it is by speaking up, whether it's by writing, whether it's by calling your congressman, your senator, and, and telling them, stand with the people of Ethiopia. That is what resistance is. That is what uh, um, uh, uh, standing for, for, the, for the people mean. Um, so that that's what I would say, um, um, but I do encourage you all to uh, go to nomore.global and uh, there is um, a way you can sign up and, and register and uh, you can get updates, uh, a newsletter and, and blogs and things that come out uh, from, from uh, No More Community, which is open for everyone who wants to participate. There will be opportunities to participate. So uh, go to the website, um, give, you know, leave your information, your email, your contact and anything that, that you would like to do locally. At the end of the day, a movement, a resistance movement is always local. So think about what can you do in your city, where, wherever you live. Um, talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, um, and, and, uh, uh, you know, and then come back and, and work with the global community. So it's always local action, global solidarity. And, and, and I think it's, it's uh, um, uh, well on its way. I think that actually speaks to a comment here. Thank you so much for everyone uh, holding at about 700 viewers. That's amazing. Um, plug, please like my or subscribe rather uh, to my YouTube page and just share this um, live chat once it goes up. Uh, appreciate everybody being engaged in the comment section. This is the most engagement I've seen and um, any live that I've done. So it's absolutely amazing. So this, I think this kind of speaks to what you were saying, Nebiye. It says, uh, Kinfe says, young Ethiopians, which comprise the majority of the Ethiopian population, need to brace to acknowledge power and action towards prospering individually. Can you please speak to the young people, uh, the Ethiopian young, please? Okay, so I'm going to, 
I think I understand what that question is. So I'll try to, uh, to uh, answer it according to my understanding. Um, and so I think what I see, and I think a lot, what a lot of young people here in the United States and across the world uh, realize is we need to all grow together. This is a global world. It can't be the super haves and a whole bunch of have nots. Social justice is important. Uh, this world is beyond you know, our state, country, um, and, and wherever there's injustice happening somewhere else, it's likely connected to where we are. And so it's just to, to feel empowered. The world is going in that direction. There's an awakening. You're not just alone in the horn. There's uh, places across the continent that are having the same um, struggle. I think these countries, African countries have to work together. South American countries have to work together. And the US has to work with those countries for better policies. Because as we see here in the United States, how much things are affected by what's happening in Asia and vice versa. And we rely on each other for goods and uh, all kinds of uh, results or uh, impact in terms of our relationships. So it's staying globally minded and um, staying away from really narrow minded tribal politics is what I would say my message. Another question and then we'll probably wrap it up in the next 10 minutes or so. Uh, so get your questions in if there's one that is, you know, that you're burning to ask. My question is, in light of the movement, what do you think will be the future of Ethiopian economic model not to create the same oligarchy? That's a big one. Do you have an answer? It's okay if you don't. Um, I, I missed it. What was the question? <laughs> it, said, it said, my question is, this is Yarit Sally. In light of the movement, what do you think will be the future of Ethiopian economic model not to create the same oligarchy? So basically, how, how do we have equity in the economy space? Yeah, you, you know, um, funny enough, already in Ethiopia, if you look at the income equality, it, it is one of the most e uh, income income equity countries in the world. There is not a, a huge income gap in Ethiopia as it is in the United States, for example. But I, I think um, with with the GERD being finished, green energy coming, um, all the ingredients and all the formulas for a successful Ethiopia is at hand. All the signs, all the indicators, all we need is peace to get there. The only thing that's on the way is the TPLF, and and once we are over this the the future of ethiopia is very bright ethiopia will be a prosperous a middle-income country before you know it and and i think that um this is the time uh, where we have a brand you know a blank page to have that dialogue um where we have um, the right to to speak and and um, organize to make sure that the right policies are in place and and to to make sure there's equity and that, that everyone is lifted up together in Ethiopia. There is extreme poverty in Ethiopia. We need a lot of help. We need a lot of economic movement to uplift our people. Um, but um, the one thing that is really, in my opinion, very critical is that we become self-sufficient and that we don't over rely on aid. Uh, we have to move away from the aid. We have to move away from dependency uh, with trade on 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 so countries that use that against you, um, and you know, look, Ethiopia has a very young population. The average age is 19, and and a very educated population that's coming up, that's energetic, that's smart, um, that's really in a very strategic place of the world. Um, and and what the other thing that's really promising is the peace and the solidarity with Eritrea, with Somalia right? It's going to be a regional growth, right? Together, um, we can uh, trade with each other, um, with the um, other African countries. There is roads being built connecting um, Africa from west to east. I mean, the entire African countries coming up, guys, I will dare to say that the future belongs to Africa and that the, the better days are ahead of us. And that's true for Ethiopia. That's true for all of Africa. And there's no reason why we can't do it better than how other countries have done it. Even when you look at energy, the entire Ethiopian economy is being built on green energy, right? And that's the future. And we're defining the future 
Um, and, and so with that, I, I say that we're on the right path. We just need peace. We just need to end this war ASAP. Oh, absolutely. It's so ridiculous that we're talking about war in this day and age. It's it, it really it really is well past its time. Uh, it can't be something that we expect or accept anywhere. From now on, if I'm hearing some sort of war uh, mongering in any part of the world, we all have to step up the same way that we're stepping up for Ethiopia. I know there's a little lag time when you're trying to figure out what's happening where, um, and some of the geopolitics is complicated, but the point is just no war period, no more war by, with, it doesn't matter the excuse, it doesn't matter the uh, uh, whoever is villainized in that country, the US or any major power has to be able to stay away from that. Although uh, what we're seeing recently is, is going in the opposite direction. Okay, I wanna read one slightly, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a complicated question. It's not a bad question, but I wanna give a chance for you know voices that aren't all agreeing, uh, I guess is the way you could put it. Uh, there was a question in here about um, basically saying, you know, the, the Ethiopian, you know, I do not want to summarize this. Nebi, take take over for me for one second until I find it. It was, I started. Okay. It was a I have another question I can address in the meantime. There was a question about Ethiopia and Eritrea that said, Abi Ahmed is uh, shying away from Isaiah Saforke. Uh, is America want him to negotiate with Wayane and together to avoid uh, Isaiah Safwerke? What do you guys think about it? Um, um, and that question came from Fikru. Um, I just want to say that um, Ethiopia and Eritrea, um, our destinies are intertwined. Our future is shared. Um, and that um, neither one of us will be better off without the other. And, and through this uh, struggle over the past year, um, it has, you know, since the peace with Eritrea, we have seen the benefit of working together, right? So um, I think that, um, you know, it is my opinion that we have no choice but to strengthen our relationship with Eritrea. We have no choice but to strengthen our relationship with Somalia. We need a strong horn of Africa. That is what it means to be, have a dream of the new horn of Africa, the new era, right? And I believe that's where we're um, headed to. And it is my absolute hope that the current leaders are still committed to that. And I believe they are committed to that. But um, the people, I can say uh, confidently that the people of Ethiopia, the people of Eritrea want nothing but solidarity, working together and uplifting each other out of poverty and, and, and you know, moving forward to a brighter future, a peaceful future um, that's not filled with secretarianism, that's not filled with... Um, you know, arm twisting from other countries. Um, you know, there is no reason the past mistakes needs to be repeated. So, for what I say is that it's absolutely necessary that 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 unity amongst the the, the tri uh, agreement between the three countries is really um, um, something that cannot be negotiated, uh, or we cannot leave it behind because I think our future depends on it. Yes, we, there's just too much suffering on the horn. Every country, every country has suffered in the last several decades and we need a, a more peaceful future. We can't keep going in these war uh, cycles. Thank you for uh, that save. I found the question. We may need you to elaborate more. I think I feel that way. But um, Bainasang Yazi says, Americans are not intervening in Ethiopia. I'm 200% sure. The question is that is Ethiopian er, are Ethiopian and Eritrean leaders ready to open doors for democracy and transparency? Um, you, you want to say, take it or? No, I know. I feel like I feel like you have something. I will add on. I I, I, I just want to make a quick statement: is that let's not measure um, our um, uh, our um, life by Western standards, all right? Africa has a different culture. Um, what is Western democracy? Really tell me where the perfect democracy is. In the United States where you have two parties? Really? Like where you have states where you're struggling to get registration to vote? So really, democracy needs to be authentic. It needs to acknowledge the local culture. 
and what is best for the people. So I'm all for democracy. We need justice. We need democracy. But let's not uh, use some imaginary, fictional Western perfection democracy as as the uh, guiding star, because that's not it. It's not it. That's not where it is. Yeah, and I don't know where this person's perspective comes from, but uh, there are talks that are happening on the Ethiopian government side in terms of trying to bring this conflict to an end. Uh, some of those, by the admission of uh, TPLF leaders, may be with TPLF leaders through moderators. Um, they're talking to uh, what appears to be opposition groups uh, or those that didn't have a say in this war starting. I don't know what more you can ask the government to do than that. I mean, there are people who are upset that they're not going all the way into Tigray and in pursuit of the leaders. Um, there are people who don't think that they should be talking to TPLF at all, but they are, uh, or it appears that they are. So that's a, I mean, that's a leap. You know, that that is putting the people first. You could dig your heels in and say, nope, we're not stopping until we get this, these with dozens of leaders, but the people are suffering with them. So the government is probably the, uh, the, the, the only thing they have or the only chance they have to getting peace in that region at this point, because we have seen the language from TPLF on their uh, pages on Facebook, through some of what they're saying through media, they're sticking with the narrative. They're sticking with the war. There was a period that they said that they intentionally, you know, chose peace, but that came after getting defeat on the um, field. So I, I, you know, I, I really don't know what in a human's capacity people want uh, the government to do in terms of trying to bring this conflict to an end when this region is completely under siege and, the regions around it have also been hurt or continue to be fought. So it's, it's, it's beyond me. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, that's what I'll say. So I don't know why you're putting it all on Ethiopia and Eritrea and not putting it on the region. I get, we all want peace, but just logically speaking, I don't really know what more um, the, uh, the Ethiopian government size side can do. Uh, I'm just going to read a few random comments. If you see ones that you like, let me know. Thank you, everybody, for staying engaged. Mostly really uh, positive or constructive commentary at the bottom. Uh, appreciate my moderator keeping things somewhat clean in here today. Uh, someone says, I thought you were saying all Africans' fate is intertwined now, Ethiopia and Eritrea. This is why the movement is fake. That uh, Okay, so uh, who knows who this is, but... You can have that conversation and still have the conversations about Af all Africans. Uh, fate is intertwined. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you. Um, that's, that's, not, that's not a real question. I mean, it's not it's, a real question. I mean, by, by geographic, we're Ethiopia and Eritrea. We're right next to each other, right? So there is a different dynamic there than, you know, holistically as Africa. But, you know, the whole African continent, that's what Pan-Africanism is, is bringing the, 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 the countries together economically, and that's what's going to happen in, in the future. Um, I, I want to add something real quick about the democracy. I'm kind of... Um, <laughs> de democracy, uh, we've been told uh, we're going to bring democracy to, to Libya. If that's what democracy looks like in Libya, I don't want it. We've been told democracy, we're going to bring it to Iraq. We've been told democracy is going to be brought to Afghanistan, to Syria. If that's what democracy, I don't want it. And is is, is democracy where I can, you know, buy a, a lobbyist and 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 get my way in, in Congress? I don't want that. So when we talk about democracy, um, do we have democracy in the U.S.? Well, how much money do you have? You know, um, what kind of lobbyists can you hire? Right. So let's not really compare. African democracy with with American or Western democracy. Um, let's create our own, you know, using our culture, uh, respect and all that, right? And we can come up with a better democracy. At the end of the day, what we want is justice. We want freedom. We want equality, right? I think that is what should be our guiding star, not some concept 
uh, from uh, a different culture that may not necessarily apply for Africa. Yeah, absolutely. There just has to be collaboration. The, the the power structure has been so lopsided for so long, and a lot of that has to do with external powers partnering with internal powers to keep the people poor. To me, it does not make sense that the French countries with French colonization history, but still use the uh, it's the I guess the African version of the uh, uh, franc. They that they, they have collaboration or partnership with. France, but are still some of the poorest countries in the entire world. It doesn't make sense. If you're getting the benefits of being in that country, then why is it not trickling down to the people? And then it feeds into that stereotype. Look at all these poor people. But how how are they getting poor? Right. And, and I think that's what the realization is coming from. It's like this is not just happening through internal uh, political issues alone. There's a lot heavier hands, more powerful hands that are in it. Um, and that's where the no more comes from. It's not about like national alliance or it, it, it just is something so much bigger than that. And, and sometimes there are countries that whose fate seem to be more intertwined than others. But at the end of the day, um, the larger continent's awakening is important. Um, there's so many questions today, but I cannot keep up. I think we're probably going to wrap it up, guys with one more because uh my moderator flagged one for me someone said i'm from haiti in the caribbean what do you think about the states invading and overthrowing our haitian president in the 70s Ooh, that's too specific for me to know about at this time but we will get back to you i'm very much engaged in it in this story in haiti um you know there's a a, a good friend Haitian journalists that um, that I, I, I speak with in terms of trying to uh, understand what's going on there. They've been dealing with a lot of uh, neo-colonization, a lot of uh, destructive policies from the U.S. And, and other Western countries as well. So from what I understand, the level of interference um, there is for the for decades, uh, going back to the Clinton era, particularly in the Clinton era, has been really aggressive um they there have been a lot of economic sanctions on them uh, and we know they're one of the first countries if not the first country um in the western hemisphere to be uh freed or first country to be freed from the of french course. colonization yeah so there there's a lot of things that were happening behind the scenes to keep haiti where it's at today and that's something that i learned about you know uh in in recent times as well so definitely the stories are very much uh, parallel. I think we're going to wrap it up, guys. I am kind of sick of hearing my own voice. <laughs> I really appreciate everybody super engaged today. It was quite the turnout. Uh, as expected, this is a conversation people really needed to have. We tried to get to as many comments and questions as possible. We always recently have been talking about how we need to do this a lot more so there's not this communication vacuum in the social media space so we will aim to do this maybe weekly i feel like that's doable uh, and try to keep it pointed to a certain topic so i hope this gave folks a little bit of something something with meat and substance and and data to pull from in terms of where u.s policy may be headed but there's still a lot we don't know. Nebu, I'm going to open it up to you for your last words. I want to say uh, happy Black History Month. Uh, February is Black History Month. I encourage you all to take some time to read uh, about the triumph of um, um, uh, Africans in the West, or uh, after the history of our African American brothers. Um, and, uh, you know, let's read something, let's learn, um, you know, beyond Ethiopia, beyond Eritrea. There's a lot of uh, history here in the West. Um, so I want to say let's celebrate happy um, Black History Month here in Denver. We're doing a, a ceremony uh, in a couple of weeks uh, where we are uh, gathering up uh, different people from different countries and sitting uh, over an Ethiopian coffee ceremony to celebrate Black History Month. So I encourage you all to use this month to take time to learn uh, about history so different Black cultures that you may not be familiar with. With that, uh, Ahmed, I thank you uh, for hosting today's event, and I want to thank everyone that participated. Uh, please make sure you subscribe to Ahmed TV. 
and, and share it on all your social media. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Yes, please subscribe uh, if you can. It uh, really helps us in terms of being able to produce these uh, segments. Really great place to end. It is Black History Month. Actually, something I'm working on is trying to find the lesser told stories uh, of, of people in Black history. It's, I'll tell you this, it's really difficult because a lot of it is written through mainstream channels and it is like, I'm seeing all the cracks. Oh, I'm not hearing your audio, you gotta unmute. So it's, it's, it takes, it's taking some uh, uh, deep research to really find stories that we're not uh, hearing about. Um, so that's something we're working on in February and you'll be able to see it in a type of space like this. So stay tuned. Thank you so much, everybody. We will do this again. Please feel free to suggest certain topics. Um, I know I'm gonna address this uh, one comment that said, you know, why was this only about Ethiopia? I, I gather you wanted to hear more about Eritrea. There's, there, there is elements to talk about with that. Um, there seemed to be a lot more to talk about in terms of Ethiopia, but we're gonna get our resident uh, Eritrean expert, Simon in here for the next one. He wasn't available today. so. We hear you. I see you. Just, just, just to be able to address that. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful night. Have a wonderful day. Uh, thank you for sitting through this with us, and we will see you soon. Thank you, Nebia. Thank you for being my guest. Thank you. It was nice to do this after a long time. Yes. Yes. It was Good great. night. <laughs> see you soon. Bye.